I mean, one of the toughest parts about being a Christian is that someday I'm going to have to explain to my son and explain to my daughters, I already have explained to my daughters, um, what it is we believe. Like, there's going to have to come a time where you sit down and you say to your kid, I believe, we believe, that a man 2,000 years ago was actually God. It was God in the flesh. And I believe that God became man and he died on a cross and that they killed him. He was all the way dead. And then he wasn't dead anymore. And now he's king. And we worship God as king. We worship God because we have been set in a proper relationship with God but through the saving acts of Jesus. Now, it's going to seem awkward to them because they've been sitting through church their whole life. They've been sitting here singing these songs. They've been going to Bible classes. They've been coloring um, They've been coloring pictures. But there's going to come a time in your kid's life, if you've got young kids, there's going to come a time where you sit down and you say, this is what we believe. This is the most important thing to us. This is what we believe. Now, I didn't realize... That that was something we were go- I was going to have to do until I was in the car with Clara. And Clara was uh, real young. She was uh, probably f- uh, late, almost four, maybe three and a half. Clara could always speak really well. Um, she was, I think she was still in two when she said, Look, Daddy, water. I was like, okay, well, that's a sentence. I guess we write that down. And she, she always, could, always had good vocabulary. And she was, re- she was looking at her little Bible. So we have this little Bible that's uh, uh, the pictures. You know, all kids have these little Bibles. And she, she came upon a picture of the cross in the background and people walking away. And they were, one was, a woman was crying and a man had his arm around her and was comforting her. And she flipped the Bible around at me. And in in the rearview mirror, she said, hey, daddy. And I looked up and she had the Bible flipped around. She said, what happened? And it hit me that that's the most important question she'll ever ask. Like, what, what happened on that day? Now, the tough part about all this is not that you're going to have to say it, that you're going to have to, um, that you're going to have to tell them what happened. You're also going to have to explain to them what what happened means to what is happening. How does what happened affect what's happening? And when you explain that, you're going to have to do so as an imperfect guide. Someone who at times does not mirror the characteristics of a Christian that does not reflect the love of God all the time. And sometimes, maybe this is true for you, it's true for me, sometimes I'm not even quite sure how exactly that whole belief system works into my current situation. I have to, that's not instinctive for me. I have to think through following Jesus. It's not my instinct. It's not a reactionary impulse just yet, but it's something I have to think about on a regular basis and sometimes I fail and my kids are going to see it. My neighbor is going to see it. And they're going to be frustrated with me and they're not going to think that it's that it's that I'm quite living up to a standard. They're going to be frustrated with you and they're going to think you're not quite living up To that standard. We went to a baseball game this past, um, and a softball game. Baseball and softball game this past weekend, uh, past Saturday. Uh, The baseball boys won state champions, uh, or whatever they call it. They won the state championship. Austin caught the last out, threw his glove into outer space. (laughs) He was so excited. Um, They did really well. Girls, Girls hit some bumps, hit a really good team, and they lost. But in all of those games, uh, they, they, they gave the announcements and everyone uh, who, who the starting lineups were in the baseball game. And they cheered for the, the scrappers, cheered for the scrappers. And the other team, we're not sure their name, cheered for their team. Shiloh Christian, right? And 
And then they announced the names of the umpires. And I was the only one. Yes! Because I knew that was the last applause they were going to get. I mean, every time, every call, everyone, someone hated him. It's got to be a tough position. Because it's, you're calling balls and strikes and people from a 45 degree angle are going, ah, that was inside. They can't, that's a joke. They can't tell, can they? <laughs> they can't. Yeah, they can't. Oh, they can't. If you're good, you can. I'm not good. <laughs> well, that guy's going to get harassed the whole time. And sometimes people are going to, now here's my, here's my problem. I can't do that. Because someday that guy's going to wander into my church. And I'm going to stand up here and he's going to go, oh, that one. <laughs> and here, here's something, another little truth. Our, our fans are actually really good. I was proud of them. We were ahead the whole time. That helps. <laughs> here's the thing that you can't either. Because we're telling a story here. We're telling a story about a resurrected Savior. And if our lives don't reflect and mirror that story, in the most difficult moments, we will not win those who are seeking to be won. And now, that's not specifically on baseball or football or um it's, it's not on sports, it's on, on dry, the way you drive and the way you interact with other people. The way you talk about people when they're not in the room, your kids hear that. Your neighbors hear that. And follow, following, following Jesus and following that story when it matters and when it's difficult can change the world. Jesus was on the cross. Said two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, or Golgotha, they crucified him there along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting Lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Uh, Jesus was the most undeserving persecution victim in history. Jesus did not deserve, he was alongside criminals, but he wasn't a criminal. He didn't deserve the punishment he was getting. But they gave it. And the words of Jesus just hit me right in my heart. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. Father, forgive them. We are called as Christians. What does this story mean? At least this part of the story. What does this story mean? And how does it impact our life? The story of the gospel, the story of Jesus on a cross, forgiving the people, crucifying Him, is a story of victims in the kingdom of God. If you love unconditionally, you will be victimized. If you show mercy, you will be victimized. If you show grace, if you're kind, if you're patient, if you're full of joy, people will make fun of you. They don't, people don't like joy. Right, Jimmy? There, you will be the victim. And following Jesus means that I am willing to forgive as I'm being taken advantage of. As 
I'm being wounded. But no, there's no, there's no uh, counter argument here. Jesus was nailed to a cross and forgave them. Now, it doesn't mean that he's going to seek them out again once he gets resurrected and say, hey, uh, remember me? Uh, you want to try it again? Like he's not, we don't return to the people who wound us. We don't return to the people who victimize us. But you forgive the people who victimize you. Forgive, forgiveness does not mean that you are, that you, that you just let everything go. Like if, if there is abusiveness in a relationship, get out and don't go back. Don't, don't let that be a normal thing. That's not healthy. But I would say this, you've got to forgive, not for his sake or her sake, but for your sake. Forgiveness is not for so that the other person can get away with something. Forgiveness is so that I won't just eat myself alive with anger and frustration and hate. Jesus forgave them. And look at what they said about him. Save yourself and us if you're the Messiah. But Jesus knew that saving himself was counterproductive to saving others. You don't save others by saving yourself too. You gotta, you gotta pick one. And so say, being the, the first or the last, being the winner or the loser, the, the one who has and the one who does not have, flattening out that hierarchy and letting us all be equal, lets us forgive people because we're all in the same boat. We're all struggling. And the Christian life, if we do not live out the forgiveness of Jesus, we will not do any good for the kingdom of God. That, that person you're thinking of right now, you don't have to be around them. But for your sake, you've got to forgive them. Now, a lot of times what people hear whenever I say you've got to forgive your enemy is that I'm on the side of your enemy and I'm not. In a way, I am on the side of all of those who have been created by God and who are loved by God, which is everyone who has been created by God. And I am on, I am on the side of repentance and justice and, and righteousness. I'm all on the side of that. But I'm not on the side of your enemy. I'm on your side here. You may hear me say, oh, Benjamin, you, you, you may hear me say I, that you've got to forgive. And you may say, Benjamin, that's... Why are you on their side? But Jesus calling us to forgive, Jesus calling us to be like Him is not because He's on the side of the enemy. It's because He's on our side. And He knows. Jesus knows that if we don't forgive, we're just going to be eat up with it. It's an old saying and it's been quoted as to, for, for many different people about who said it. But forget, failing to forgive your enemy is like taking rat poison every day hoping they'll eventually die. It's, just, it's only hard on you. It's not hard on them. One of the things that helps me here is, is a, a bit of a mantra Rachel and I have. Because pe people can be uh, harsh to preachers. And not in like the way you think. Sometimes you think preachers, they'll, they'll say... Maybe around here people would say, oh, you're not teaching the truth or whatever. People rarely say things like that to me. But they're real quick to be like, hey, you put on some pounds. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I guess you just, everyone has carte blanche just to just throw insults at the preacher. I haven't had a haircut in a while. Okay, thank you. You can trim that beard. Okay, yeah. If you can call it a beard. People are just real quick to say whatever they want to about anything in your life. And one of the things uh, 
Rachel and I have to say over and over again in situations like this is we have to say, um, we need to start over with that person. Um, that's something we like, we'll, we'll be, one of us will be griping and the other one, usually Rachel will be like, well, we need to, we need to start over with them. Because if we, if we always make them out to be that, they're always going to be that, no matter they, whether they change or not. And so I'm going to start over with them. Because they're important to God. And so Jesus looks down from the cross and sees the people crucifying Him and He says, they are important to God. And if He can do that, you can do it for, the, for that sister-in-law that was a little too sassy at the last Christmas dinner. I hate it when I say something, people start looking at people. I try not to look you in the eyes after that, right? We, but like the, the things that get to us, the things that we take offense at and stay, we stay offended forever are, are absurd when you look at Jesus on the cross dying. These people are not just watching him die. They're in charge of his death. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They don't know any better. Now, at this point, you may have people say, well, you know, technically, the peop- there are people who know better. Okay. Weasel your way out of the commands of God. And see where that gets you. See where that takes you in life. See, see how that influences your, your, your spirit and your joy and your peace. Jesus calls us to forgive. He says at the end of the, uh, the prayer he gives in Matthew chapter 6, the last part of that prayer, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then he goes on to explain it. For if you don't forgive your brother who sins against you, in the same way you forgive your brother who sins against you, your father will forgive you. So if you don't forgive your brother, what happens? Maybe I need to use Church of Christ language. This is a matter of salvation. And not just our salvation, it's a matter of salvation for the world. Because if we tell this story without living this story, people won't believe this story. We're, we, we've got to live it out. And then we can testify, right? Did we, I, I just abandoned Church of Christ language, didn't I? <laughs> then we can witness. <laughs> then we can say, this is what happened. And this is, how you, this is how this person hurt me. But I love them and I pray for them. Because it matters, but not just because it matters, but because my king told me to, and my king did it. And I can't tell you the story of Jesus on a, on a, in, in a book that is written on a horrible analogy that I just lost. I can't tell you the story of Jesus um, in, in a book that's withered by, by pain and, and grievances and, uh, and being offended can't tell you the story of Jesus in a book bound by grudges. People won't believe it. It's not just for your salvation, your redemption. It's for the redemption of the world that we grant and show people the way God has treated us by treating them the same way. And Jesus on the cross took the the victimizers and told them they were forgiven. In that very moment, he, for, he asked God to forgive them. Isn't that a second step? Right? We're on the first step, which is forgiving them ourselves. But asking God to forgive them is the second eternal step that I... Not only do I not... I, I don't want you to hold them accountable for their actions, God. In the eternal life. It's a hope in our core that people 
are redeemed and saved and brought to mercy and salvation, brought into right standing with God. We've, we have got to feel that, and we've got to start working on feeling it pretty quick. Because the damage you do while you refuse to follow the command of Jesus, and follow the example of Jesus. The damage you do while you refuse to live out the story you tell, tell does damage to the story you tell. You, you, are, you are hurting the kingdom of God by claiming Christ and not living Christ. And we need your help. We need it. Next time someone says, you hear someone say this, Go to, go to McDonald's in the morning and just sit with old guys. But I believe McDonald's ships in and sits there as like a company policy, right? Where's Dana? No? Yeah, right, Dana? Yes, she said yes, they do it. You'll hear. And the world's not, doesn't follow Jesus like they used to. But really, if we're following Jesus... Like Jesus did it, we could probably respond, yeah, we just don't forgive like we used to. We don't love our enemy like we used to. Now, I'm not, you might have some words about whether we've ever really loved our enemies all that well. Or we've ever really forgiven all that well. We've actually been pretty good at holding grudges and, and wanting to defeat our enemies. Pretty good at that. We are called to, to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, forgive as we've been forgiven, as we are being victims. Not when it's all said and done. And I, I'll tell you what this is going to take. It's going to take you to breathe. You're going to have to breathe. What I mean by that is, um, try this in your marriage. This will help your marriage. Your spouse says, your mother. In, one, two, three, out, four, five, six. Respond. No, you're, no, don't do that. But we are. I think sometimes our instincts, our, at, our reactions aren't healthy. And we're called to respond, not react. And so I can, if you give me just a second, I can filter my first thought through the lens of Jesus. But it takes me a second. And I'm guessing it takes you a second. So your words and your thoughts and your actions need to take a second. You don't need to say them right away. Some of you in arguments don't even have anything to say. You just start saying it. And what comes out is never, I'm sorry. What comes out is never, I'll consider it. I'll think about it. Let's pray about it. But if we could just sit for a moment and think, how would Jesus do this. It looks a lot like the first, the people we want to be first becoming last. And the people we want to be last being exalted and put first. It looks a lot like the blind seeing and those who think they can see being blind. It looks a lot like church. Kingdom. We are all victims of somebody. And we all follow a king who was victimized too. And so we are called to respond like he responds so that we too can play our role in changing this world to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth through our church. You are not condemned if you are bad at this. If 
you are not helping save others either. You're not condemned if you're bad at this, but you're not really moving the kingdom of heaven forward any either. You're called to love our enemies. Pray for those that we that persecute us. Pray for those we disagree with. Pray for those we think are making horrible and huge decisions. Pray for those people who are taxing on your life. Because there's a good shot, shot nobody's actually threatening your life. But there are people who are drags to it. Pray for them. Forgive them as quick as you can. It may take a while. But it's worth every bit of effort you have to let the story of God be lived out in your life so that when you tell your kids about what happened, they will see how what happened affects what is happening in their home. And then they can go and live that out in the world themselves. If what happened hasn't affect what is happening in your life or if you've never responded to what happened. Jesus died and rose for you and calls you to follow him as king. You've never responded to that call. Whatever the resp- wherever the response leads you, if you've never responded to that, please for the first time come today and if, you, if, if your life needs prayer and you need to just you, you, you just haven't been affected. Or maybe you've got an enemy that you need us to pray for. Whatever you need this morning, please come forward while we stand and sing.